This webinar is going to be recorded. Um, my name is Brandi Waliga. I'm with Violence Free Colorado. I'm the Technical Assistance and Training Specialist. And our brown bag webinar this month is Surviving Your First Year of Advocacy, What You Really Need to Know. And Liz Stewie, who is the Training and Technical Assistance Manager here at Violence Free Colorado, is going to be presenting. Uh, feel free if you'd like to introduce yourselves in the chat box, um, name and your organization, if you want to put your role, that's great. Um, and please select the um, all panelists and attendees on the drop down menu if you want to share that with everybody. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Liz and we'll get started. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today and taking some time out of your busy schedules um, to talk about this really important topic. Um, as Brandy said, my name is Liz Stewie. I'm the Training and Technical Assistance Manager here at Violence Free Colorado. I started my career in advocacy um, many years ago as um, a hotline advocate for volunteer for a domestic violence shelter. Um, I went on to have a lot of different advocacy roles, including court advocate, shelter advocate, um, and finally I was a shelter manager. So I've had a lot of different roles um, within domestic violence organizations. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful today that I can share some, some new information with you um, and give you some things to think about in your own work. So starting off, thank you everybody for introducing yourselves. Also, if you wanna put one word in your chat box to describe how you're feeling right now, um, that would be wonderful. So I just wanna acknowledge that um, it's, been a, it's been a really difficult time. We're, we're living through a period of increased need for our services as domestic violence and sexual assault advocates. Um, we're living through a time of heightened racism and violence in our communities. Um, and so I just wanna acknowledge um, that it's a really challenging time um, being an advocate is never easy work, um, but it's important and it's even more important now um, than ever before. So I want to say that and I also want to say thank you um, for doing the work that you do. Um, it is so very crucial and it makes such a big difference in our communities. Um, so I, I hope you, even if you don't get to hear it enough in your day-to-day -day work, I hope you hold on to the fact that your work and you as a person are really valued. Um, in our community, especially by Violence Free Colorado. We, we get to see peaks of all the hard work that you're doing, um, and it is really vital and important right now for our communities. So I am going to launch a poll. So you should see a pop-up. We know that sometimes folks can't see the poll questions if you're on a mobile device or something like that. So I put it up here. So if you feel like you wanna answer in the chat box, if you can't see the poll, you're welcome to do so. We're just getting a sense of, you know, who's on the line today, where everybody um, is coming from. So I'll give you just a quick minute to answer that. Great. Let's uh, we just give another about 10 seconds or so. So if you want to answer, jump on the poll real quick. Great. So I'm going to share the results now. So it looks like we have um, almost 70% of folks are in their first year of advocacy. Awesome. Welcome. And the rest of our folks who have been an advocate um, for, for more than a year, which is also wonderful. I hope to give you um, lots of tidbits um, and information, things to take you, even if you have been an advocate for a while, that can be really helpful in your work. So thank you all for answering that poll. And before we continue, I also want to say I love questions, um, concerns, comments, your own wisdom. So please feel free to share that in the chat at any point. Um, you don't have to hold questions till the end. I'm happy to answer questions as we go through. So here's a quick rundown um, of the major topics that we're going to cover today. Obviously, um, this is a huge topic, thinking about, you know, what do you really need um, as your foundational advocacy skills. This could be hours and hours <laughs> of training. So we're going to hit the high points today. Um, but also, um, I want you to know that Brandy and I are here to support you in this work. 
So if you need more information about any of these topics, you want to chat with us one on one to process some of your ideas. Um, if you just need somebody to talk to, um, Brandy and I are here um, for you. And I've got my contact information at the end of the slides. Um, but you also probably have that in your email that you got about this. So please, um, you know, that is our role here at Violence Free Colorado. Um, Brandy and I are the training and technical assistance team and the core function of our job is to support you um, and the advocates in the programs and the amazing work that you're doing. So don't hesitate to um, lean on us as a resource for you. So first thing we're gonna talk about today is a little bit um, of nuts and bolts. So we're gonna talk about tracking your training or professional development or um, onboarding or whatever um, goes by a lot of different names. So it is very important that as new advocates that you are keeping track of your training hours that you receive. I'm actually gonna put a link in the chat right now um, to a form I'm gonna talk about in a second. So why is it important that you track your hours? So as you all know, since you are advocates, um, is that um, community-based domestic violence advocates in the state of Colorado who have had um, 15 hours of training for domestic violence 30 hours of training for domestic violence and dual sexual assault programs. Um, you know that once you have those hours, you have legal privilege. That is your ability to protect a survivor's confidentiality. It is part of Colorado law, it is part of federal law. Um, it's very important and it's actually a pretty unique feature. Most folks who work in social service agencies don't have the level of confidentiality that advocates have and it's very important. It's what helps survivors um, trust us um, and getting support from us. It's what allows us to um, protect folks who are in dangerous situations by not sharing their information. Um, so it's very important. Um, so that being said, you know you need to have that 15 or 30 hours depending on your program. Um, and as a new advocate, you need to have your own documentation um, of that training. So your program will keep the documentation. And if you don't currently have your documentation, you can probably ask for a copy from your, your training file or your employee file. And that's great. Your program should be keeping this information as well, but you as an advocate should also hold on to that because um, if somebody um, seeks to challenge privilege in a court, um, seeks to um, kind of overturn that privilege, you're going to, be able, you're going to need to be able to prove that you have that training. Um, and so it's important that you as an individual have that documentation. Um, and there isn't, a lot of, there isn't a lot of guidance about what that documentation has to look like in the law. Um, it's very open-ended. So what I did in the link that's in the chat right now um, is just a quick Excel document um, that will allow you to track the training that you've done in there. So we recommend that you keep a running list of the trainings that you're attending. For example, you could add today's training to that list as well. And then it's at, at a minimum for your first 15 hours, we recommend that you have some kind of backup documentation of that. There's no, like it doesn't need to have a signature or anything on that. For example, your, um, your confirmation email that you received after you signed up for this webinar, that would count as backup documentation. So we want you to have that on hand um, as an advocate for a couple of reasons. One, because it allows you to um, protect yourself if there is a challenge to your confidentiality. And um, in the state of Colorado, the, um, the consequences for violating um, somebody's confidentiality, not being able to protect it. Um, so say if you didn't, if you were working directly with survivors and you didn't have your 15 hours, you couldn't, you couldn't show a court here is the training I attended either internally within your organization or within another organization such as the Violence Free Colorado um, or with COVA or any of the other training. It doesn't have to be a particular type of training. Um, you just have to be able to prove that you have it and it's related to your advocacy work. Um, that The consequences of that potentially are a misdemeanor for the individual um, yourself. So um, having a copy of your training is just a way to protect yourself in those situations. Now, there could also be organizational consequences for something like that, such as um, a reduction of funding or some kind of consequence with funders. But there also is a pretty um, big uh, potential risk for you as an individual. 
So just keep a hold of this. The other reason that it's important to have this is if you are, um, if you're switching organizations, if you move um, potentially even to another state, but absolutely within Colorado, your training that you've received your 15 hours, those go with you. You only have to get those 15 or 30 hours once. Um, and so they can travel with you if you have them documented. Um, so having that available, that will help you as well as you advance in your career um, and uh, uh, take on new challenges. So um, please feel free to use that tracking. You can also modify it, you know, make the tracking what works best for you. It doesn't have to be that. Um, that's just a good template to start from. So any questions about that? This is kind of the legal practical <laughs> um, portion of this training. So we just want you to have, be prepared um, to have that information available. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is building your support system. And this is one of the really crucial um, ways. We see a, a lot of research that um, dealing with secondary trauma um, can really be helped by having a strong social support system. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is coworkers, right? Our coworkers. Um, oh, great question, April. Um, yes, um, if you are using the Violence Free Colorado Online Learning Se um, Center, once you finish those courses, there is a certificate that you can print, and that would be perfect for your backup documentation. So yes, so for your first 15 to 30 hours, depending if you're a with what kind of program you are, if you're a dual sexual assault organization, um, yes, you'll want to print those off. Um, your organization will want to keep a copy and you'll want to keep a copy for yourself. Um, so yes, April, that's a great, great question. Um, and that's the perfect example of, um, of having those. So yes, so if you're a dual sexual assault DV organization, you will want to have 30 hours minimum of backup documentation available. Great. So thinking about your support system, kind of the first and easiest access and really the folks who will understand what you're going through in a very real way are your coworkers, right? Coworkers can be a wonderful support system. Um, and there are just a couple of things that can help um, really strengthen and set those, those boundaries with coworkers. Um, so a lot of times we think about, you know, when we're working with survivors and things like that, we think about setting boundaries. But sometimes we don't always think about setting those within um, between coworker relationships. But it can be really helpful to keep those relationships healthy and functional. Um, so this is actually a recommendation from the wonderful folks at the National Center for Domestic Violence, Trauma, and Mental Health. Um, they really recommend um, just having a check-in point with coworkers before you share something um, really challenging that you're dealing with, which is, are you in a good place to listen to me talk about this? So that acknowledges that you know you have something challenging you want to talk with your coworkers about, and also um, gives them a time to give consent for that conversation and space to say, you know what, I just had a really difficult situation come up, and I'm not in a place where I can really take on any more information right now. Um, and so um, for coworkers, you really just want to start using this question on a regular basis and also expressing your boundaries with your coworkers, right? So if you are struggling, if you feel like your cup is full, and you really don't have space to talk with somebody else um, about something that they're going through, um, communicate with that with them. I mean, obviously do that in a nice way and say, hey, you know, I really want to be able to support you, but I'm not in a place where I can take on um, this conversation right now, you know, is there somebody else you could talk to? Um, could we revisit this conversation tomorrow? Whatever that boundary you need to set is really helpful. And then the second thing that can be great in building relationships with your coworkers is helping each other take a pause. Um, so a great example for this is if you um, get off of a really difficult crisis call. You know, you've just spent an hour on the phone talking to somebody who's in a really terrible situation and listening to their story. Um, and that can be a lot. <clears throat> and you've really, um, you really feel a little bit overwhelmed by that conversation or um, just feel like your, your cup is full at the moment. So the thing you can do with your coworkers is say, hey, can I take, can I step outside and, you know, take a five minute walk? Could you cover the phone lines for 10 minutes for me? you know, while I go, um, you know, grab a snack or whatever that is, is um, 
being able to rely on each other so that you can be that person for your coworkers sometime, offering them a chance to take a quick pause. Um, and then you can also communicate your needs um, when you need to take um, a quick break. Now, obviously, this is, this is a little bit different right now, right? Um, in the world of COVID, so many of us are working from home. Um, but you can still communicate this via, if you have an internal chat, um, like in Teams, um, or via email. Um, just because we're working from home um, doesn't make these things any less of a challenge. Um, and so if you're covering phone lines or if you're doing something where a coworker could help you take a break, um, take a pause after a challenging situation, please communicate that with your coworkers. Um, and it can be kind of um, a challenge to do it at first. It feels a little weird, but once you've done that, you can also say, hey, also, I want you to feel like you can say this to me as well. Um, and that creates that healthy relationship where you're, you're both able to step up when you feel like it or to take a step back when you need it. So the other thing I wanna talk about is that friends and family are a wonderful support system. And it can be hard as a new advocate to really understand how to include your friends and family in your work life. You know, most folks don't work jobs where they can't really share with their friends and family the details of what they do day to day, right? So obviously confidentiality allows us from sharing a lot of those details um, with the folks closest to us, which can feel really weird can feel really isolating, can feel like we maybe don't get the support that we want um, from friends or family. So really, when you're thinking about what you can share as an advocate, I want you to think about sharing things in big generalities. Um, so uh, for example, um, and this is especially true, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I did a lot of my direct service in a rural community. So if I said something um, to my husband along the lines of, um, you know, I had a really hard day at work. You know, we had, um, you know, a family of uh, six kids all under the age of 12 in shelter at the same time. And it was just chaos. You know, if I said something like that in my community, that information, just, you know, a family of six kids all under the age of 12 is possibly identifiable information, right? I wouldn't have wanted to share that because in our community, it would have been pretty easy for him to figure out exactly who that family was. So in that situation, instead, I would say something along the lines of, there were so many people in shelter today that it was pure chaos. There were kids running around. I felt really overwhelmed. You know, at one point it was so loud, I couldn't even hear the phone ring, right? So those are details about your own personal experience that doesn't share personally identifiable information about survivors. Um, so when you're thinking about what you can share with friends and family, you're really thinking about what's going on for you, what was difficult about it. And sometimes we use situations as shorthand um, because our friends and family know us really well. And so, you know, we can say, you know, maybe your friends and family know that you struggle with really loud noises, right? And so if you say, oh, you know, there are six kids under 12 running around, they automatically know that's a challenge. Um, but since we can't do that for fear of, you know, violating somebody's confidentiality and um, wanting to protect survivors, we want to do that in a way that really focuses on our emotions. I felt so overwhelmed by how noisy it was, you know, there were kids everywhere um, and focus on those internal feelings. Um, so don't shy away. Um, from including people um, in a way you would with any other job. You know, it's important to have that support from friends and family, but just think about how you do it. Um, and it's going to feel a little unnatural at first, totally normal, um, but it will get easier as you practice with it and eventually it will just become second hand. You know, after my first couple of years working in advocacy, I didn't have to think about it anymore. I could just say, you know, um, work was really hard today because, because I felt really overwhelmed um, or because um, someone shared a story um, that really hit home for me. And it, it becomes second nature to share that information with friends and family um, in a way um, that doesn't um, rub up against confidentiality. So my second big piece of advice around friends and family is that they may not fully understand what you do, right? 
we can talk about the experience of being an advocate all the time, but honestly, it's a very unique experience. Um, and it's something that not all of our friends and family are totally going to understand. And that's okay. They can understand to a point, you know, we can, we can try and explain it the best we can. Um, but what is really helpful is to directly ask for what would be helpful from them. And sometimes it's hard to know exactly what would be helpful. So this takes some self-exploration, um, spending some time getting to know yourself um, and what you need. Um, but hopefully with some practice, you can get to a point to ask for exactly what you need. Um, you know, when I was working in shelter and when we had every bed in the house full and it was, a, you know, it was a tough week and I felt really overwhelmed. And my mom would, you know, ask me, you know, what can I, what can I do for you? What do you need? I could easily say things like, you know, if you could drop off some groceries for me on Saturday, that would be amazing. Or if you could just call and check on me, you know, on Sunday night, or, you know, maybe we could, um, you know, <laughs> pre-COVID time, we could go do something fun to take my mind off of work. You know, you'll start to develop what works for you, try several different things, um, but then be explicit with your friends and family, right? They love you. They want to do what's best for you. They just often don't understand um, what you're going through if they haven't experienced something similar. So be upfront. I can't, I had a friend who had a puppy. I can't tell you how many times I called her and just said, hey, can I come over and see your baby Corgi puppy? Because that would be really great self-care for me right now. Those kinds of things, people that care about you like doing those kinds of things. They want to know how they can help. Um, so being clear with them on what they can do to support you can really strengthen your relationship and can also help you, especially in that first year when everything um, is really new and can be overwhelming. Anybody have any questions about that? Great, well, feel free to ask questions as they pop up um, as we're going. Um, so I am actually going to launch another poll. Well, actually, no, I'm gonna wait until the end of the section to do that. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is um, supervision. So this supervision is a really key thing for you as an advocate, um, especially as a new advocate to help you understand what your role is, what your expectations for your job is. It's also really helpful for um, managing secondary trauma. Um, so, and one thing I really noticed is nowhere in our society do we ever get to really learn either about being super, being a supervisor or being supervised as an employee. That's just not something that gets talked about a lot or that we can learn a lot about. So um, this is kind of a new thing and I think it's extra important for advocates um, and for your own um, health and safety and professional development. So you wanna take an active role in your own supervision. You want to partner with your supervisor um, to really help you excel in your role. Um, so supervision has a huge impact on how employees see their work environment. Um, people are much happier in their jobs overall. They have a clear understanding of what our job expectations are. And that's another thing that I think is really challenging for domestic violence and sexual assault advocacies. Our jobs can be very different from day to day, um, and they can change based on the needs of the folks we're working with, um, based on what's going on in our community. Obviously, all of our jobs change drastically related to the pandemic. Um, it's, it's a lot, um, and advocacy can look very different from day to day, and that is okay, but it makes it even more important that we have consistent support from our supervisors. Um, so we really, we recommend, um, a lot of the be best practices recommend um, getting supervision once a week or once every other week. Um, so this is something to talk with your supervisor about if you're not already doing regular supervision and just ask if that would be possible. You know, say you want to take an active role in it um, and reach out for support that it would be helpful for you. Um, I find that supervision is hard for all organizations for different reasons. For smaller organizations, it's hard because there's maybe one or two people that supervise all the advocates on staff. So supervision can be a heavy load for them. And then for larger organizations, it can be a challenge because of the number of people that need supervision. So it's hard for different programs in different ways. 
um, and that's okay. And it's worth working through the challenging of scheduling, of having to reschedule sometimes. I mean, obviously things come up. Um, our work involves crisis sometimes, a lot of times. Um, and so, you know, we need to be flexible in rescheduling supervision um, and working around things. But at the end of the day, it really is worth it to have regular supervision. It helps you build trust with your supervisor. Um, and that's going to be great when you're dealing with difficult situations. Having a person that you trust, um, that you can go to for help, will make those really challenging situations a little bit easier. Um, and there is a lot of research um, out there around secondary trauma and reflective supervision. Um, so being able to reflect on your experiences as they relate to um, survivors sharing their stories with you um, is really powerful in reducing um, the effects of secondary trauma on a person. We're gonna talk about the impacts of trauma and burnout a little bit later um, in this session. We're gonna talk more about what specifically that looks like, um, but supervision can reduce that. One, you're not carrying that burden alone. Um, and you're getting in input um, to help you problem solve through some of those more challenging situations. Um, you get feedback. So that way, if you're doing something, um, you find out something that your supervisor doesn't want you to do or wants you to do differently, you know sooner rather than later. Um, this can be really helpful, especially, you know, filling out paperwork for the first time, you know, after you do your first intake, having your supervisor look over the paperwork and make sure you, you're doing that right asking them questions about challenging things around that, um, all of that can be really helpful for getting um, feedback. And because you're getting feedback, you're also going to help have better outcomes um, for survivors. Um, oh, interesting. So thank you for sharing this. Someone said in, in the chat, um, I find the difficulty with this part in particular because I came from law enforcement and you don't share anything, much less work stress with your supervisor. That is really interesting. And yes, and I would imagine that there are some um, uh, organizations, even community-based organizations that have similar cultures. So I, I think this is a time to have an open and honest conversation with your supervisor about um, you know, how they can best support you and what your challenges are. Um, and that's okay. Maybe, maybe your first couple of supervisions will feel kind of unnatural and uncomfortable and you'll be navigating what your boundaries of what you wanna share um, and what you don't wanna share with your supervisor. Um, and hopefully after a little bit of practice, you'll find kind of a comfortable middle um, of, of what you are sharing um, versus kind of like what, the, what your culture, overall culture of the organization and sharing is. Um, but I recommend trying it out. I think that even if it's hard, even if it's a paradigm shift, um, that it can really be more supportive for you and your work um, and for you as an advocate um, for dealing with secondary trauma. So I recommend trying it out even when it's, even when it's a challenge or even if you have to um, really kind of advocate for yourself to have that time. So again, supervision um, is a topic that could cover days of training. Um, so I want to just share this kind of reflective supervision model with you because I think as somebody who's being supervised, it's really helpful to think about kind of what that process looks like. Um, so it starts at the top um, with the event or experience. So this is what happens um, between you and a survivor, what a survivor shares with you. Um, and then in the next step, you're exploring your thoughts and feelings. So you're processing internally what that meant to you, what that felt like to you. Um, and then you can share some of that with your supervisor. Um, and that can help you check your perspectives. That can help you get feedback on how you handled the situation. And then you can work in partnership with your supervisor, hopefully, um, to come up with solutions, um, to come up with self-care action items to help you. Um, and then the process kind of starts all over again with your next interaction. Um, the slide is again from the National Center for Domestic Violence, Trauma and Mental Health. Um, they have done a lot more in-depth training about supervision. So if you ever want more resources or wanna talk more in depth with us about supervision, please reach out because Brandy and I would love to talk with you more about that. So now I'm going to launch the second poll question. Oh, 
All right. So hopefully you see a pop up um, that has the poll questions. Um, if not, and you feel comfortable answering these in the chat, please feel free to also do that. So I'm just going to give folks a couple of seconds um, to answer the poll. All right, I'll just give folks a couple more seconds to, to answer these. And just so you know, these are all anonymous polls, not even I can see on the back end who answers what. So we're not tracking that for anything. Um, this is more for conversation purposes. I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and share the results so everybody can see them. So the first question, do you have supervision at least every week or every other week? We had 76% say yes. 24% say no. Um, and if you answer no, do you feel comfortable using these materials to bring up the topic with your supervisor? So we had 81% um, say yes, and 19% say that they were unsure. Um, so those folks who were unsure about it, um, Brandy and I would love to talk with you more. If this is something you're interested in doing and want support around, we can absolutely talk with you more in depth about it um, and support you through that process if you'd like. So. We have talked about supervision, a very important tool for surviving your first year of advocacy. Honestly, I think it's a very important tool for surviving any year of advocacy. And it's also something that's gonna grow and change as you grow and change as an advocate. Um, so it's something I recommend revisiting, um, really thinking of something that is flexible and living, that's gonna grow with you and grow with your needs as an advocate. Great, yes, Brandy just put the link um, to the National Center in the chat. Tons of great resources um, available on their website as well. Um, so creating healthy boundaries. Again, this is a topic that could span days and days of training, as it should, it's very important. Um, so I'm just going to cover a couple of key points, but I'd love to hear your questions or anything else that you've learned or that has helped you in creating healthy boundaries in your work. Um, because this is something, even if you're in your first year as, advocate, as advocates, you know, a lot of folks come to advocacy from law enforcement or social work or other fields where you already have skills around creating healthy boundaries. So if you have things that have helped you, please put those in the chat box. Um, so the first point I put on here um, is that survivors don't need to be fixed or saved. So we get into this work because we want to help people, right? Nobody is an advocate because they want to get rich, right? We are all here because we want to support survivors um, and help build healthy communities. Um, and so because we all have that drive and that passion around this work, it can be hard um, to not to see yourself as a fixer or a saver. Um, and that happens. I also want to identify that this especially happens um, at, for, with white folks, um, and I know myself, I struggled with this as a new advocate, um, this idea that we can um, come in and fix or save problems. Um, so it really helps to have the perspective of partnering with um, your, the person you're working with, the family that you're working with, that you are a supportive and empowering advocate um, as, uh, as a partnership role. Um, so if you've taken our online learning course um, about advocacy, you know a lot of times we use the, the metaphor of the bus, right? Survivors are driving the bus. We as advocates are sitting on the bus with them and we're maybe reading the map for them or we're providing them resources or we're answering questions for them, um, but we are not the ones actually driving the bus or choosing the direction of where to go. Um, this can also be really helpful in um, thinking about your own internal biases, you know, especially folks um, who, who, are, who come from healthy families or are in healthy relationships. We know what has worked for us and creating those relationships and sometimes it, sometimes it can be hard to remember that everybody kind of has their own path to 
offers that um, and their own way of getting there. So really leaning into the survivors being in charge of the work and us being there as support and resources for them. So the flip side of that is if we are not, you know, saviors, if we are not the ones who are responsible for everything that happens, that also is a burden off of us. At the end of the day, the survivor gets to make the best choice for them. It may not be the choice that we would make personally. Um, you know, we may not fully understand why that choice is being made, but we can still support that decision, provide resources and empowerment um, in that moment. And hopefully <clears throat> that will take some of the burden off you as an advocate, thinking that you have to fix everything um, and that you have to be responsible for everything that happens because you truly can't be, and you truly aren't responsible for everything that happens. Um, so working on reducing judgment. Um, so I will say that this is also something I struggled with um, as a new advocate, um, especially around substance use. So we know that survivors use substances to cope with the trauma that they've experienced. That is unfortunately incredibly common. Um, it is a choice that they, they are making um, to cope with the situation um, and the trauma that they've experienced. And so our judgment um, not only can be harmful for the survivor, it can be harmful for ourselves as advocates. Um, so kind of taking a step back from that um, and saying that, okay, I'm, I may not agree personally with that decision, but that's not my life. Um, that I don't, I wouldn't have to make that decision. That doesn't impact me. What can I do to support that survivor? What do they need um, to get to that place? If that survivor is wanting to stop using substances, what resources um, and community support can I provide them um, and really listen to them and uplift their decisions? And how can, if that is not where they're at in their life, how can I help practice harm reduction with them? How can I help them be as safe as possible um, as they can be? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing this, Karina. That is great. Survivors come from a place of control, right? That, that is why folks are coming to our program. It's because somebody in their lives is exercising power and control over them. Um, and when, when survivors see that from us, um, it, can, it can be really damaging for them. They will feel more comfortable coming to us, sharing with us um, if we have less judgment and an open perspective. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you know, the, the last thing we wanna do is replicate what the survivors are coming from. Um, and unfortunately, as advocates who control some of the resources within our programs, that can be a challenge, right? If we're deciding whether or not somebody gets shelter or we're deciding whether or not somebody gets a housing voucher or something like that, that is a position of power and control. So we really need to be aware of that. We need to um, not be using that um, in a way that um, exercises control over somebody. We wanna be using that in a trauma-informed manner. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That can be really helpful. And then identifying what is and isn't within your um, scope of control. Um, this relates to what before with um, the direct action of survivors, but this also relates to community resources. I mean, I, how many folks do we work with whose um, the trauma they've experienced, the dangers that they are in could be fixed if they had free access to safe housing, right? I, you know, we have a, a housing and economic um, development program within Violence Free because we know it's such a crucial thing. But as advocates, we can't just create these housing opportunities um, in our community. We can work towards them, we can advocate for them, but at the end of the day, you know, we are not responsible for the level of housing that's available in our community. And that's really hard when we can see what survivors need what resources they need. And there is some of it available in our community, but there's not actually enough of it to meet the full need of survivors. That can be a place for advocates that feels really hopeless um, and helpless. And so understanding where you do have control, um, where you can do the best you can, um, and where you might have to step back and say, this is the best that, that I can offer. This is what community resources are available. Unfortunately, there aren't more resources available at this time, um, and, you know, and that's not my full responsibility to fix that, um, which is hard. It's very hard, um, but it's worth trying to kind of separate that um, 
from yourself when you're able to. Otherwise, um, you will really burn yourself out very quickly. So thank you for the folks that have been sharing. That's really helpful. Yes, housing crisis is out of the scope of our control. It is statewide, everywhere in Colorado. It is nationwide in a lot of situations, and especially right now with the pandemic, with some of the eviction protection being lifted. Housing is a true crisis. It's a community-wide crisis. And we can contribute to the solutions by advocating for our survivors, for talking with our elected officials, for talking with our supervisors and our executive directors about you know, what they're doing in the community to help um, promote and support programs that develop more housing. But at the end of the day, that's all we can do. Um, I know if we could all magically create safe housing for everybody, we would all do it in a heartbeat. Um, so that is something that is generally outside of our control. So next thing I'm gonna talk about real quick is finding a mentor. Um, so mentors are um, folks who can help support you in your goals as an advocate. Um, and those goals are gonna be really different throughout your career. Um, and so in your first year of advocacy, I recommend identifying one of your biggest challenges and um, trying to find a mentor who can help you address that challenge directly. Um, so identifying your biggest challenge is sometimes hard. So I really recommend getting curious about your emotional responses, the things that are happening, about times when you're frustrated or you're feeling hopeless. Um, and um, I, I really recommend writing, journaling about those experiences, writing them down to really help you identify what some of those biggest challenges are. Um, and some, some examples of that, for me, in my first year, some of my biggest challenges were, one, being consistent with self-care um, and really thinking on a regular basis about how I'm caring for myself. Um, that was hard. You know, I was um, skipping my lunch break to help survivors. I was, you know, not taking a break. I was taking too many on-call shifts in a row. All of those things, that was a big challenge for me um, because I saw the need and I wanted to respond to it, but I wasn't balancing that with my own needs as a human. Um, and so luckily I had another manager in my program who wasn't my direct supervisor. She had a lot of experience with self-care and was willing um, to have lunch with me a couple of times a month um, to talk with me about it. Um, and there wasn't anything formal that we did other than I would share with her things that I was trying um, and it gave me kind of an accountability partner. I was like, okay, I know that this person is gonna be checking in with me at least once a month. I wanna have something to tell her. <laughs> so it helped me really exercise that. Um, and it also just helped me talk through it. Sometimes we just need to talk through our challenges. Um, so for new advocates, those of you in your first year, the easiest way to find a mentor is within your own program, right? You have to worry less about um, confidentiality issues. Um, this person is going to know what you're going through. This person is going to have some insight into, into exactly what your experience is in as an employee of the organization. So I recommend that. But as your career as an advocate grows and changes, your mentors might grow and change. You might have multiple at the same time. Um, but it is important to acknowledge one of your challenges and directly seek out support for that. And for some folks, that may be your direct supervisor. Your direct supervisor is somebody that can help you address this challenge. That's great. Or if you can have both your direct supervisor and another mentor in the organization, that's great too. Um, and it will change over the years. Um, and don't, don't be afraid to ask people directly if they're interested. And even if folks don't have any formal experience in mentoring, um, just but sometimes you can frame it as an accountability partner or a check-in buddy or just somebody else who is thinking about your challenge with you um, and is making space to listen to you um, talk about what your challenges are and help partner with you to find solutions for them. So I highly recommend finding a mentor. Um, another thing I want to say is that you know, we at Violence Free Colorado, we also mentor advocates sometimes. If there's a specific challenge that you're working through um, and you, you don't have anybody specifically when you're within your organization that can really address that, and you wanna reach out for support, 
obviously you can't share confidential details with us about your work, but you can share general things. Um, so for example, especially if you're struggling with self-care or burnout, you know, that's something that um, we have materials and research um, and have thought about a lot, and that's something we could potentially support you with. So that's another resource too, um, if you're not finding what you're looking for um, within your own organization. So now I'm gonna talk about a little bit about burnout and secondary trauma. Um, so again, big topic, we could talk about this forever, um, but I'm gonna hit a couple of big points. So secondary trauma, um, will happen with everybody. It's gonna, and sometimes it leads to burnout and sometimes it doesn't. So we separate these three. We say secondary trauma is inevitable. It's what happens um, when you receive indirect exposure to trauma through a firsthand account or narrative of a traumatic event, right? That um, really could apply to, to every hotline call we take. Um, and yes, for folks who asked in the chat, we are recording this um, and we have the slides available. Um, so this will be available on our YouTube page um, and the slides will be available for you to download. So great question, thank you. So burnout is essentially what happens when the secondary trauma becomes so much um, that you're in a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. It occurs when you feel overwhelmed, emotionally drained, and unable to meet constant demands. So burnout can come from secondary trauma. It can also come from other things, such as overwork, um, too, too heavy of a workload, demands on it. Burnout can come from things that are happening in your personal life, and it can be a combination of all of those things. So this is a resource we highly recommend. Um, a couple of years ago, um, the author of this book um, came to Colorado. I mean, we actually mailed copies of this book to every program in the state. So there may be a copy of this book floating around your organization somewhere. I recommend you check it out. A lot of libraries also have it and or you can request your library to buy it or you can buy yourself a copy. I have my own very dog-eared, highlighted, written in copy of this um, that has really helped me throughout my career. Um, but I love this quote from it, um, that if we are to do our work with suffering people and environments in a sustainable way, we must work to understand how that impacts us. So you cannot do the work of a domestic violence or sexual assault advocate without being impacted um, by the survivors in both good and in challenging ways. Um, so I really recommend this is a great place to start um, the book is written by an advocate. It's written in a really accessible way. Um, she, she uses humor and um, illustrations and charts, and it's just a really helpful place to start, um, especially within your first year of advocacy. I didn't get this book until later um, in my advocacy career, and I wished I had had this, and I had read this during my first year. So a couple of things, one of the best things you can do um, is to understand the signs of burnout and or trauma exposure. So when you recognize these signs within yourself, um, then you can take steps to address them. You know, one of the challenging things, and you've probably seen this with survivors, is when they are experiencing trauma, when they are acting from their trauma or acting in response to, to their trauma in a way that they don't even recognize, right? that makes it even harder to address what they're experiencing. So I highly recommend you looking at this list. So this is a general list, right? Every advocate's gonna be a little bit different. Um, so you're going to be, need to be curious and aware um, of your own reactions, your own emotional state, um, because things might look a little different. Nobody is gonna do all of these things. Some folks may do none of these things. Um, and that doesn't mean they're not experiencing burnout or trauma exposure. These are just some of the most common ones. Um, I will say for me, I experienced a lot of hypervigilance in my first year, you know, um, obsessively making sure all of the locks and the security were on in the shelter. Um, you know, I became really aware of a lot of dangerous parts of my community that I was, was maybe not aware of before um, in the ways in which violence was happening that I just, didn't even fully understand before I became an advocate. So that was something I, I faced a lot. 
Um, I also faced a lot of guilt, feeling like I wasn't doing enough to help survivors or, you know, having to see survivors make really difficult choices because there weren't better options available for them um, was really hard. Um, and so those were two of kind of my big signs of trauma exposure and response. Um, so these things can happen and maybe not rise to the level of burnout. Um, but these are things to talk with your supervisor and or your mentor about. Um, this is another great thing to talk with your coworkers about so that maybe your coworkers um, can notice some of these signs. Be like, hey, you seem to be um, really um, angry today. You know, what's going on with you? Do you need to talk with somebody? That's something that you can both provide um, as a coworker to your, your fellow advocates. It's something they can do for you. So um, sharing these slides with your coworkers would be a great way to kind of start, hey, could we start, you know, talking about the ways our work impacts us um, and how we can deal with that. Again, if anybody has questions, please feel free to, to interrupt or uh, chime in. Um, so here are some things that um, you can talk about and ask for support with your supervisors. Um, so having responses to secondary trauma is totally normal. It's a normal human response. Um, and so you are not bad or wrong for experiencing any of those, any of these feelings. Um, if you've experienced these, that's okay. Um, that is normal and we wanna give you resources to help you deal with that um, instead of it being something that you as an individual have to deal with on your own. This is something that we as advocates deal with. Um, and we want to kind of normalize it so that we can work on responding to it. Getting curious, right? Um, that is one of the biggest takeaways I hope you take from this, this brown bag is that you need to be curious about yourself. You need to spend time exploring your own emotions. I recommend writing. I recommend talking with somebody. Um, I recommend really thinking about your own responses, getting curious about that, um, and that will really help you navigate some of these challenges. Getting help with self-care, right? Most of us <laughs> don't come from communities in which we're taught self-care. Like, we don't teach self-care in high school or college. You know, we don't necessarily talk about it that much either. Um, and so if you don't exactly know how to practice self-care, or you struggle with practicing, practicing it consistently, that is okay. It is a skill, it's something you can learn and get better with, um, but it's something you need to talk about on a regular basis with your supervisor. Um, sometimes self-care can be really um, set, the burden can be placed on the individual, which obviously the individual has to participate in self-care or else it's not gonna work, but there's also an element of community care um, that is really important as well. How we take care of each other as advocates, how we um, make sure we're taking care of ourselves so that doesn't impact the folks that we're working with. Um, leading by example, right? So everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and maybe you know something about self-care or secondary trauma that other folks in your organization don't. So bring your strength, bring your experience, bring your knowledge that you already have. Even as a new advocate, you have a lot to offer. Um, your organization. So lead by example. Um, and then identify training opportunities, just like you would think about doing ongoing professional development um, about um, working with survivors um, or about answering crisis calls or parts of your own work. Um, think about self-care as one of those elements as well that you want to continue to get um, education and training around. And then I think it's also helpful when we think of um, ways that which we can prevent burnout. Um, so these four um, elements, they're traits among stress resistant persons. Um, and this comes from some work that's included um, in the book I mentioned earlier and some work that also comes from Futures About Violence. Um, so these four things can really help us manage the impacts of secondary trauma, burnout, and stress. Um, so a sense of personal control, what's within my control, what is not within my control, as we talked about earlier, um, pursuit of personally meaningful tasks. So this is self-care. This is your creative endeavors. These are the things you love in your personal life. And making time and space for those outside of work um, can be really important. Healthy lifestyle choices. 
this is going to be really particular to your individual needs. You get to decide what this means for you. Um, for a lot of advocates, it could be something like um, taking a walk, um, doing yoga, getting therapy, um, taking art classes, you know, whatever is healthy for you as an individual, um, you know, incorporating that into. And then social support. And this is why we talked about family and friends and also building support within your supervisors and coworkers. So this is the point where I also want to recognize um, that folks who are dealing with multiple forms of oppression, um, racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, those other forms of oppression um, that as both as advocates and as survivors as well um, can impact folks' level of secondary trauma and burnout. You know, things like racism um, really is a trauma. And so this is something that both advocates and survivors are experiencing. And that is going to be an additional challenge um, that we wanna try and support you as an advocate um, as well, um, but also something that you can talk about within your organization about getting support around that. Um, and so we wanna be aware of these things that are impacting both our lives and the lives of the survivors we work with. And we want to acknowledge that um, and as we're working towards ending that within our organizations, then our society as a whole, um, how can we support advocates through that as well? Again, this is just a quick touch on a very big, very important topic that we could do a lot more about and hopefully will in the future. Um, so if this sparks anything for you and you want to talk about it or get more resources, please feel free to reach out to us. So we have a couple of minutes left. So first I wanna open it up to any um, questions or concerns, um, or Brandy, anything that has come up for, for you um, based on your experience as an advocate. Thanks, Liz. I think that you covered so many great topics. Um, you know, especially when you're thinking about um, being a new advocate, really I want to emphasize there's no wrong questions, especially if you're working with folks who maybe have been in the field a, bit, a little bit longer than you've been. Um, you know, I always encourage folks to ask questions um, to, and that it's okay, even if it seems like the most obvious of questions, but you, you just don't know. And so it can feel hard, especially if you're, again, you're in a, maybe a new job environment, but asking questions is, is definitely the number one. Um, and Liz mentioned earlier about being curious and having that internal curiosity and also, you know, bridging that into external curiosity, asking, you know, asking your coworkers and uh, folks that you work with, you know, how, how do they handle things or what was it like for them being um, a, an advocate when they were newer can be really helpful. Wonderful. We've already got somebody who's shared um, in the chat box about things you're going to incorporate into your work moving forward. Um, they wrote, I plan to continue investing in the traits of stress resistant persons. Awesome. That is great. That is, I'm just going to go back to that slide, these four traits on the right um, that are really wonderful um, to think about. We have another um, person who shared. I really need to work on implementing self-care. I have work and school, just do not make time to take care of myself. Absolutely. That is an ongoing struggle. I wanna say that you are not alone. Um, I realized last week that I had gone two days in a row without stopping to eat lunch, right? That is one of my signs that I've learned over the years as, as an advocate that I am, that I am too stressed out and I need to practice more self-care. That's one of those things I've learned about myself. Um, so, yes, that is wonderful. Um, I really recommend grabbing that book if you don't have it already, um, but also we'd love to talk to you about more strategies if you want to talk more one-on-one. -on -one. We had another folk person share that they are going to journal on an off shift about struggles and things that come up um, and that I find myself focusing on so I can unpack with a mentor or supervisor. Awesome. It's so wonderful to hear. I think that is a really great strategy. It's amazing what we can learn about ourselves when we write it down and or talk about it with another person. It really is an important way to learn about yourself. Um, and yes, we will send out 
um, the recording will be on our YouTube. We'll also send out the slides um, to everybody. Thank you so much for sharing. I think one, one last thing that I wanna leave you on is that it is really important to also acknowledge your own wisdom as a person. Even if this is your first year in advocacy, even if this is the first professional job you've ever had, you already have a lot of wisdom and experience as a person. You have a lot of valuable experience to share. So um, I want you to think about that too and how you can um, really support yourself and share your knowledge and experience with other folks. And I wanna say thank you all for, um, for joining us during this, this time. I know it is a very stressful time. Um, and thank you so much um, for all of your hard work and we appreciate you being here. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brandy for any wrap up. Thanks Liz, thanks for such a wonderful presentation and thank you all for hanging in there and um, to the end with us too. And uh, one thing I'll let you all know is um, be on the lookout, our brown bag in February, which will be February 9th, is gonna be about economic justice in Colorado. So um, talking really about supporting survivors as they work towards um, economic stability. That will be an awesome brown bag as well. So be on the lookout for that. And also be on the lookout, we're gonna be doing a um, vicarious trauma webinar in February. So be on the lookout for that coming up. Um, so we'll have a lot of great uh, webinars and things headed, out, headed your way and feel free to reach out to us for any questions or anything at all. So thank you all so much. And I'm um, gonna go ahead and um, end our recording in a second here. Oh, and uh, the question about are there dates for those yet? So um, I can tell you that the vicarious trauma webinar will be on February 24th. Um, and then, I, like I mentioned, the next brown bag will be on February 9th. So there'll be some email blasts coming out very shortly with those. So thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day.